On May 28, 1900, San Francisco policemen formed a perimeter around Chinatown and set about building an eight-foot-high wall around the district using cement blocks and barbed wire. City officials had recently diagnosed bubonic plague in the neighborhood and wanted to quarantine the nearly 20,000 people living there. The populace was violently opposed to being sealed inside Chinatown. Many people worked outside the district. They had jobs to get to from which they were prevented. As tensions flared, an influential group of merchants known as the Chinese Six Companies sprang into action. They filed suit against the San Francisco Board of Health, alleging the quarantine had violated the rights of the Chinese. Chinese immigrants were lured to California by the prospect of striking it rich in the gold rush and work on the Transcontinental Railroad. By 1852, there were 18,000 Chinese in the state of California. Once that final golden spike was driven, thank you very much, the welcome mat was withdrawn, and suddenly there was a label surplus. Prohibited from owning property, Chinese workers flocked to San Francisco's growing urban center. In 1853, the area centered at Sacramento and DuPont Streets was dubbed Chinatown by the press. Chinatown grew to 12 blocks of crowded houses, businesses, temples, family associations, and restaurants. Chinatowns primarily exist because Chinese weren't allowed to live in white neighborhoods or any other neighborhood. They are what sociologists call ethnic enclaves, where people like to live with people who speak their language or eat similar foods or practice the same religion. But they're also confining. Anti-Chinese sentiment was codified by federal law. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 prohibited all Chinese from citizenship, essentially relegating them to the margins of society. The residents of Chinatown were really stuck. They were Americans, but they weren't. You know, they weren't allowed to be citizens. They weren't allowed to own property. They weren't allowed many fundamental rights. In response, wealthy Chinese merchants banded together to serve the immigrant community A consortium of district associations formed called the Chinese Six Companies. The leaders of the Six Companies were the biggest merchants uh, in Chinatown, the most influential members of their group. So the Chinese Six Companies were essentially you know, quasi-fraternal organizations, quasi-business organizations that essentially self-ruling form of government in Chinatown. The Chinese Six Companies helped Chinese come from and return to China, aided the sick, and returned corpses to China for burial. As discrimination and bigotry grew, so did the response from the Chinese Six Companies. You have to understand that the white community really wanted nothing to do with the Chinese community in terms of governing the Chinese. And so the Six Companies was formed to provide a governance. If they had a matter of dispute with the government, the city government or the state government, they would send their representatives to negotiate with them or to protest. In early June, as Chinatown residents remained encircled in barbed wire, the lawsuit supported by the Chinese six companies against San Francisco's Board of Health was argued in circuit court. The quarantine lines were not drawn in a straight line around all businesses in the region, that they zigged and zagged to exclude white merchants. Clearly, this was prima facie evidence that the quarantine was racially discriminatory. Judge Morrow, he says, clearly this measure looks like it was racially discriminatory. Look at the way the boundaries are drawn. 
It's very clear that the Caucasians on the perimeter are being treated differently, and this violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The Chinese six companies had scored a legal victory that brought an end to the 18-day quarantine and lifted the economic burden for Chinatown residents. And it was ultimately those court challenges that were the undoing of the quarantine.